no commitment because uh, when a transition happens, the size of the one that you guys have just went through, um, a lot of people think that it doesn't get any bigger than the pastor. And there can be some truth to that, but I'm telling you, when the worship begins to shift and change, that's one of the biggest changes a house will ever do. Yeah. It really is, and I'm talking from experience, I've seen that. Um, it's when everybody settles into how they've always done it, it becomes very, very tricky, stinky, <laughs> difficult, and you have to really tread lightly and move carefully and slowly with a lot of love and TLC, but yet still with an end goal in mind, right? And so that just requires that you be intentional. So I can't thank them enough for their commitment. Amen. Yes. Give them a hand one more time. I'm going to ask you to do something different today. I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet and read this chapter with me this morning. This is a, a famous chapter. It's Psalm 91, the 91st Psalm. We call it our insurance policy sometimes. Amen. It's the presence of God. Now, Stacy is going to be a dear. She's going to read, so she's going to lead. But I want all of us to read it together this morning. So just all lift up your voices and let's go through it together. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We know this word is truth. We know this word is life. Bring it all off of the page and cause it to become life to us this morning and strength and nourishment and encouragement as well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can be seated this morning. In verse 1, it says, the Most High, the Most High is the Hebrew word Shaddai, Shaddai, and it's a, it's a word, it's a root word, Shaddai, that has many, many descriptive and expressive meanings of the name of God. It's not just one or two meanings, it has multiple meanings. It can mean, and some of them are pretty cool, by the way, it can mean God of the mountain, it can mean God, the destroyer of enemies. It can also mean God the self-sufficient one or God the nurturer of babies. It can mean the breasted one, literally. It can mean God Almighty. So Psalms 91 reveals to us that the presence of God is meant to be our dwelling place and our hiding place. Moses is the author of this psalm. And when he mentions God's presence as a secret place, he's revealing to us that God is a safe place to hide. He's a place of refuge. In fact, he goes on throughout that chapter and he refer refers to God's presence as a refuge, a stronghold, a fortress, a shelter, a covering, a shield, and a dwelling place. Yeah. Now, we've been talking about Gideon through the month of January. We've been talking about consecration. We've been talking about the assignment that came to Gideon. Historically, throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, God's children, when God's children left His presence, 
And they begin to seek fulfillment from things that could not produce life because those idols weren't living. The things they were worshiping other than God were not alive, so they couldn't produce life. Inevitably, what would happen when they would remove themselves from God's presence is they would be attacked. They would come up under attack and they would end up being carried off into captivity or by, by enemy forces. So outside his presence, they began to seek out shelter from their enemies, which usually ended up being a cave or a den. Right. So I want to briefly shine a light on four men who God called out of the cave when he found them for the first time. It's Gideon, who we've already really shown the light on. Elijah is another one. King David is one. And then Lazarus. Now, we've discussed Gideon in detail. God calls him in chapter 6 and the Midian uh, and all of the men of Israel out of the caves, out of hiding, but he specifically calls him to deliver the nation from the hand of Midian. We covered it as Judges 6 2, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites and children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which were in the mountains. So Gideon was called to come out of that hiding place. To deliver Israel from the contention that had been in their face. 1 Samuel 13, 16 is another text that reveals this. When the men of Israel saw they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. Elijah the prophet was another guy who ended up in a cave. He was struggling with loneliness. He was struggling with depression. Threats had been made against his life. And this is right on the hills of just an out, outstanding, tremendous victory. Him literally calling down fire from heaven. But you know what I found is sometimes the people that do have a flair from the dramatic tend to have uh, depressing moments when they find themselves alone. Oh, yeah. With their own thoughts. It's true. Right. Because they're used to God dealing in a fabulous outward manifestation, power, fire, yeah. glory falling. But when they're alone with their own thoughts, at times if they don't steward those thoughts well, they'll find themselves hiding in a cave. Yes, sir. That's, right. so that's what happens to Elijah. 1 Kings 19.11. God is talking to his prophet in this text. Stacy, read, uh, pick up verse, 1 Kings 19, verse 11. He finds him in a cave hiding. Then he, <coughs> then he said, go out this did he say, oh, just go ahead. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. See, he's used to this stuff, Elijah is. He's used to fire coming from heaven. He's used to all kinds of stuff. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice, a whisper, it translates literally, a whisper. Right. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> what are you doing here, Elijah? Yeah. So in that day, Old Testament and New Testament both, caves were generally used as places of burial or hiding places for thieves, robbers, and criminals. People who were on the run. We've already talked about Gideon. David was anointed to be king in dramatic fashion, but not everybody was excited about his anointing. Not everyone was excited about his calling. So Saul, the present king, became jealous of him because of the victories that he was winning and the attention he was getting from the people. So he begins to intentionally try to kill him and take him out. He wanted him dead. So he flees for his life. He ends up hiding in a cave, at the cave of Adullam. And others whose lives haven't worked out the way they thought it would <laughs> make their way to him. And a small army ends up hiding with him. So this must have been a pretty big place. <laughs> While he's hiding in the cave, a revelation hits him, a realization. And he starts writing songs about it. We're going to talk about that at the end this morning, okay? But the short version of the story is that he was called from the cave to the castle. So Elijah is called out of the cave, and when he steps out of the cave and encounters God in the whisper, God gives him his next assignment. So just like he calls Elijah out of the cave so he can reveal himself in a new way to him and through him, Jesus also finds himself standing outside of the cave in John chapter 11. And he too calls the man out of the cave when he says, Lazarus, come forth. So my subject this morning, my title, what I want to talk to you about is 
Come out, come out, wherever you are. <laughs> Tell a couple people beside you, point at them, say, come out, come out, wherever you are. John chapter 11, verse 35, is as far as I know the shortest verse in the Bible. I don't need Stacy to read it for me. Sure. It's so short. Yeah. <laughs> the shortest verse in the Bible says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Short verse, short words, but very profound, very powerful words. So what is it about that statement that the Lord wants us to know about Jesus? So let's slide that to the back burner and let's talk for just a minute about, about Jesus and the gifts that he gave to men. I want to talk to you about the role he was functioning in in the story of Elijah. So back burner. Everybody say back burner. Back burner. That's simmering for just a minute, okay? In Ephesians 4, it says that when Jesus ascended, he gave gifts unto the men, right? And those gifts are commonly referred to as the ascension gifts or the charismatic gifts, the fivefold gifts. They are apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. Now, in effect, what he did was he gave himself to humanity by distributing who he was in his fullness to various men and women. The full grace that he had within himself was broken down into five functions and it was divided among men and women. Now, there are three types of gifts, three classifications or categories of gifts mentioned in the New Testament. There are the redemptive gifts that the Father gives us in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to break it down. I, you, you'd be surprised. As a teacher, I have enough trouble staying on track as it is. I mean, I want to change rabbit trails dead all the time. And, I, and so I, I'm going to stay on point today. The redemptive gifts come through our spiritual DNA. They're tied to the core of who we are, the core passions of what, the, of what we're passionate about and what really we burn in our hearts to, to accomplish in the earth. These are the redemptive gifts. The second category the Holy Spirit gave the believer gifts, every believer, all believers. And that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in order to accomplish individual, collective, and corporate purposes. And to promote overall health to the body of Christ. And we said last week those gifts don't even have to always function in a church setting. Sometimes they can function out in the world as well, and they should. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a quick side story. Let me scan the room real quick. Well, my friend made it this morning. Had a guy, had a new guy cut my hair this past week, and we just got to talking, and he starts spilling his story to me. Inevitably, when people find out I'm a pastor, one of two things happen. They either shut down because they get very intimidated and they stop talking because they don't want to say the wrong thing or they don't want to slip a cuss word out. But when they find out that I grew up on construction sites, they usually settle down a little bit. You know? And uh, so I tell them, I still got family members who are barely saved, you know? Uh, so don't, don't sweat the details. But the other side, if they don't shut down and go into quiet mode on me, then they open up and spill their whole life story to me. Everything they're facing, everything they're dealing with. And a young man did this last week, and I had a chance to minister to him while sitting in the chair. I, I fully expect him to visit us at some point. Yeah. <laughs> the third set of gifts are the ones that here Jesus gave or assigned gifts to men and women. The fivefold gifts for the equipping of the saints. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. The reason why... The, earth, the church is not having the full effect in the earth that it's intended to or designed to is that a fivefold likes to get together in buildings and practice their gift over and over and over again. Yep. Yep. And we measure success by the size of the congregations that we have or the cash flow coming in, the butts and the seats, that type of thing. Right. But effective ministry from fivefold only really takes place when we're equipping saints for the work of ministry. Yeah. The grace of my life is to equip you to get busy working for the Lord. That's right. Is to equip you to step up and heal the sick and pray for the sick, to cast out devils. Is to equip you and teach you and give you the confidence that you need to flow in the gifts of the Spirit in every setting and in all settings. Amen. But who you perceive Jesus to be upon your initial encounter is more than likely sometimes tied to whatever redemptive gift the Father has in you or a unique personality that you're gifted with, or maybe a need, a need that you have in your present situation. Let me give you a couple of examples and then we'll move on. The woman at the well, 
if you remember the story of the woman at the well that Jesus encountered, she was looking for a paradigm shift in how to worship. She perceived him to be a prophet, so guess what? He prophesied to her. Nicodemus perceived him to be a teacher, so he taught him. Right. Legion needed an evangelist. He had a need in his life to be set free and delivered. Yeah. So he needed an evangelist. So he comes and he sets him free. And then he releases him into evangelistic assignment in Decapolis, wow. the place of 10 cities. To the disciples, at times he was a pastor. He spent time with them. He cared for them. He nourished them. Many times Pastor Jesus looked out and was moved with compassion for the crowds as well. And he said, let's feed them. Let's, let's heal them. Let's just heal the sick while we're here. He was moved with compassion. Then, then those 12 and the 70, there's a place in Scripture that talks about the 70 disciples as well. He went back and forth from being a pastor to an apostle sent from God. There's one place where it literally says, he brings them in, he exhorts them, he encourages them, then he sends them out. All 70 of them, he sends them out. And interestingly enough, and forgive me for not having the text ready this morning, it's really, it's, this is one of my bunny trails. He sends them out, and it says the disciples went out. Later in the chapter, when they come back, it says the apostles returned. So the 70 went from being disciples to apostles. Now why? Not that it wasn't, they didn't go out and have business cards that said apostle so-and-so. That's not what they, apostle just means sent one. One sent on an assignment. So they functioned apostolically when they were sent by Jesus, the chief apostle himself. Right. So Jesus gave these gifts to men when he ascended because it was not intended for any one of us to carry the fullness, the fullness of what he did right. apart from our connections to one another. Come on. All right. We need our connections to one another. Yep. Now let me be clear. We carry the fullness of who he is because the spirit of, him, of God dwells in us and we don't have him in portions. Okay? We don't have him in portions. He lives in us. He dwells in us. So we carry the fullness of who he is, but the fullness of what he does is designed to be achieved collectively and corporately, not individually. All right. <clears throat> I'm going somewhere with this. So in some stories, you see Jesus functioning in multiple graces. And this is one of those stories. The story of Lazarus, he's functioning in multiple graces. You can see hints of all five graces manifest at different times over a four-day period. In the Old Testament, I'm going to explain to you why. In the Old Testament paradigm, of which they were still operating in at this time that Jesus was walking around on the earth until the cross, there were three offices that worked together for the people on behalf of heaven. Okay? Three offices that worked together for the people on behalf of heaven. This was an Old Testament paradigm. Do you want to know what they are? Yeah. Prophet, priest, and king. That's the Old Testament paradigm, prophet, priest, and king, okay? So in the story of Lazarus, we see all three. We see all three. So the first thing I wanna highlight from the story is that Jesus is a weeping priest. He's a priest, okay? The writer of Hebrews agrees with this statement. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. He was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So think of that with me this morning. A God that can be touched. A God that can be touched. A God that's moved with compassion. A God who cries. A God who cares. A priest who's moved with compassion and touched by the feelings of our infirmities and our weaknesses. So this particular text of all things that he is, this particular text is not addressing the creative power of God. It's not addressing his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, but it's addressing his role as a priest. Right. So by serving as my priest, he's functioning, and he's serving and functioning as my mediator. He's representing himself in his closest form to me. He's my priest. He's, he's my priest. He's related to me. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, the priest had to be one from among them, yep. or he had to be a kinsman redeemer. Right. So he is one from among us. He is our kinsman redeemer. He's sharing the human experience with us, and he cares for what we're afflicted with, every one of us. Yep. Now, you care more deeply for the thing that you're willing to share with one another. When you share your burden, when you share your troubles, when you share your heart, 
then you tend to care more deeply. We have a God who can be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses, and it's nice to know He can be touched. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that some people ask how you're doing, and while you're still clearing your throat, getting ready to give them an answer, they've already walked away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or they're looking through you, not at you. Because they're already thinking about the next conversation or the next place they have to be. Now, I'm not being hateful. That's just the reality of how we all can be at times. Yeah, yeah. Busy, distracted, a lot of stuff on our mind, a lot of stuff on our plate. So sometimes we don't really slow down enough to have an authentic connection with someone that had, where the conversation can really truly be fruitful. But thank God that He lingers with us long enough. He sticks around long enough with me to hear what I have to say and to find out how I feel about it. He cares how I feel about the situations that I'm facing in my life. And it's not just that he cares about the facts, because there's a sharp contrast sometimes between my feelings and my facts. There's a sharp contrast between the truth of what his word says about me and the facts in my life sometimes. Yes, sir. And how I feel about those facts. God is not like a computer that's only interested in facts. You enter facts in the computer and compiles data, but it's unable to process emotion. It's unable to process how you feel about a situation because it only compiles data and facts, okay? In spite of the fact that God's more accurate than any computer we could ever find or know, in spite of the fact that He's capable of recording far more facts and details, and He truly does know the truth. In fact, not only does He know the truth, He is the truth. He doesn't just know it, He is. In spite of all that, He's not cold to me, He's not callous to me, He's not indifferent to my circumstances. Scripture says that He cares for me and He cares how I feel. Yeah. Now, I believe I'm talking to someone this morning because we've been through some stuff recently. Yeah. Yeah. And when I say we, I don't just mean Life Center. I don't just mean six of us in the room. I mean humanity. That's right. Yeah. Has been through some stuff this past couple of years and He cares. Yeah. He knows when my head hangs low and He asks questions like, Why is your countenance falling? Right. Yeah. Why are you fearful? Yeah, come on. He cares. Look at how he cares about us. Yeah, he he translates every moan we have, every groan we have. He knows what we mean when we sigh deeply. He knows what's going on. He knows how we feel when our eyes fill with tears. Yeah. He knows. He translates all of that. He he says things like, "Let not your heart be troubled." Yeah. Look at how he cares about us. Our our troubles, our dilemmas, our circumstances. He can be touched by my feelings, and he cares for me. And that's important because sometimes in the world we live in, not everybody cares. Amen. Sometimes you encounter people that don't seem to care. And if they care, it's not obvious in the way they treat us sometimes. Hey, right. <laughs> so people can stay, say stuff to you, people can do stuff to you, and not even think about the consequences of their actions. Not even think about the pain that they cause you with their actions. Yeah. Hebrews 5 goes on to read, Hebrews 5 verses 1 through 2, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to their weaknesses. Right. He is us, baby. Yeah. <laughs> he knows what it's like to be us. He knows what it's like to hurt like we hurt. He can be touched by the feelings of our weaknesses. Yeah. Touched by the loss of a loved one. He's touched by that. Yeah. He's touched by the disappointment of the job we didn't get or the job that we lost. He's touched by the baby who was still born. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. touched by the marriage gone cold. Yeah. He's touched by the marriage that's fallen apart, coming to an end. He's touched by the gleam that left your eye or the skip that left your step. He's touched by the hurts that you have in your heart. He's yeah. touched by He's touched by the nights I can't sleep because it's so heavy on me. He's touched by the groaning that happens on the inside when I'm driving down the road. And I know it's difficult to do this any, any justice because it's hard to imagine the creator of the universe cares about the details of our life. Right, yeah. Now we can talk for hours about how powerful he is. We can unpack how omniscient he is, how omnipotent he is, how powerful, how wonderful, how majestic he is. The Bible says he sits on the circle of the earth. He's complete. He's whole. He is completely self-sufficient. He, he needs nothing. He's so complete. The words that come from his mouth are more powerful than any arsenal of weapons on this planet. Wow. Yeah. That's how powerful he is. He's invincible. He's immutable. He's all powerful. He's the everlasting God. In fact, he said, behold, the Lord thy God is one God, 
Beside him there is no other. Right. He said that about himself. He said there's never been another God before me. There'll never be another God after me. I alone am God and I will be your God and you will be my people. Amen. Now think of this. That, that kind of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Master of the Oceans. He's, he's that This God, as big as he is, would take the time to sit down with me and to care with me. And to suffer with me and to hurt with me. Uh -huh. To care about how I'm feeling. Now what that tells me is we better be careful how we treat people. Yeah. Because he cares. <laughs> yeah. And if he cares about me, then he cares about you. Yeah. And you. Yeah. And he cares about all of us because he is our father. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes this is why sibling rivalry pricks his heart so deeply. Because the person you see as an enemy, he sees as a son. Yeah. Yeah. The person you see as an enemy, he sees as a daughter. Yeah. A really messed up son or daughter who is inflicting pain on other people because of the hurt that they have in their own life. Right. So sometimes we want to hate, but his heart burns with love for all of humanity. Yeah. For all of us as sons and daughters. Yeah. So he cares for us. Now, I can be wrong, and you still have to be careful how you treat me. Because he cares. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He cares. You know how it is when someone gets onto your child? Your child maybe has misbehaved, maybe maybe they deserve to be God and auntie, but then someone gets on them and they take it just a little too far. Yeah. How many parents I got in the room? Or grandparents. Yeah. Now your child can be wrong, but at that moment it's not about whether they're wrong or right, because that's your child. That's your kid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sure. There was a guy when my brother and I were 12, 13 years old. Church was about to start on a Sunday night. And we were running through the hallways, big church like this, so the kids did what kids do. We would run and play, play hide and seek in the parsing buildings that weren't being used, you know. So we're running through. I had already come through, but my brother comes through, and this man who was a deacon in the church grabbed my brother, slammed him into the wall back in the hallway, lifted him up off of his feet, wow. and said, stop running in the church. Now, my brother needed to be disciplined. My dad, in fact, saw it happen. My dad walked over there, and he took my brother outside, and he gave him a spanking. And he said, stop running in the church and go set your butt down in the seat. Then he turned around to the guy and he said, if you ever lay your hand on my son, you will have to answer to me, and I will take you out of the parking lot of Google's office. And that guy's face got three shades of red, but he knew better than to say anything back. Don't mess with my kids. Amen? Yeah. I know they're not perfect. I know they get attitudes. I know they mess up. But that's my baby. Come on. Yeah. Amen? Come on. Yeah. If I feel that way about my kids, how does he feel about us? Yeah. Yeah. He cares. Right. He cares. Go ahead and discipline them, but be careful not to go too far. Don't cross the line that shouldn't be crossed because he cares. And the truth of the matter is, if anyone's going to flip out on my kids, it's going to be me. Yeah. <laughs> because they know how much I love them. So when I flip out on them, they know it's coming from a place of love. That's right. I have put the work in to prove how much I love them. Yes. You're his child, and I want you to know he cares about you. Now, most of us don't understand what it's like to be loved by God that way. We don't know what it's like to be loved that way. We're so used to a superficial love that it takes a lot of time and a lot of layers being peeled off to unpack godly love, yes. agape love. He'll love a prodigal son back home. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. He cares so deeply for the woman caught in the act of adultery, he makes her want to go and sin no more. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm talking about the God they love, yeah, his love. Right. Now you understand your mama loves you, your daddy loves you, your husband, your wife loves you, your babies love you. We can grasp that kind of love, but it's hard to get your mind wrapped around the kind of love that God has for you and I. Yeah. He knows everything about us. Now listen to me. We'll end up here when we conclude today. The things that we hide deep down inside of us that we don't want anyone around us to know, He knows. Yeah. Yeah. The right. thoughts that we struggle with, that we know are right, we just don't know how to stop thinking them. Right. But for God's sakes, we don't want everyone to know. He knows. Right. He knows all about us. He knows about our imaginations. He knows our cravings. He knows our ideas. He knows our shortcomings. He knows our faults. He knows our temperaments. He knows our attitudes. And in spite of knowing everything he knows about us, he loves us. He loves us. So news traveled to Jesus, and the news said, Lazarus is sick. 
And Jesus says, okay, I'll go see him then. But then he delays his departure. He delays his departure. He doesn't put a rush on it. And when you read the story of Lazarus, the, the Jesus that you see in different parts of the story looks different. He looks different in different parts of the story. Initially, he's not too moved by the news of Lazarus' sickness. He tarries for a while and he waits before he leaves. And it's not like he has to wait. It's not like he has to go purchase a ticket and travel. <laughs> it's not like, I mean, he could, he doesn't even have to walk if he doesn't want to. He could disappear from here and reappear over there. In fact, he doesn't even have to go. When the centurion came to him and said, I have a servant laying at home sick, he said, I don't even need you to go, Jesus. I just need you to release a word and call him healed, and I know he'll be healed. And it worked. <laughs> he, Jesus didn't have to make the trip. But he lingers here in this story when it seems like he should be in a hurry. It seems like a time-sensitive situation. You ever had a time-sensitive situation in your life? Oh, yeah. The problem is our definition of time-sensitive is often different than his. Yeah. Yeah. So he lingers when it seems he should be in a hurry, and it makes me wonder, who is he? Sometimes the Lord delays his coming at times when I'm really in a crisis, and I need an answer now. I need an answer now, and it makes me wonder, who is he? <laughs> or at least, how is he? <laughs> but for sure, Absolutely for sure. Yeah. Where is he? Yeah. Because I need him. Where is he? Yeah. Now, it's it's funny to have conversations like this. Some people get uncomfortable. Some people don't want anyone to know they ever think this way about God. But we thought we knew him, but it makes us think strange things when he delays his arrival in a situation. Yes. And let's be honest, we worship him sometimes, and at the same time we're worshiping, we're struggling to really understand him. Yeah. We're really struggling to understand him. When he hears about Lazarus being sick, he seems cool, almost nonchalant. Yeah. So I'm going to put things in context for you, okay? Lazarus' life is slipping away by this point. He's gasping for breath. He's laying there dying. And Jesus isn't in a hurry to get there. Now, I can't criticize Mary and Martha for saying, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I really can't criticize him for that. I mean, Lazarus is dying. His family and friends are all watching it. And Jesus simply says, Lazarus sleeps. When it's over, I'll go wake him up. Now, if I'm going to tell you about a God who cares, then I also have to tell you about a God who stays cool in chaos. A God who is calm in calamity. Yeah. It's almost as though he's, as he's, it seems as though he's indifferent to the agony that you're in. And it makes us ask questions like, why won't you fix this? <laughs> why won't you fix this? I mean, I could work better for you if you would heal me, Lord. I mean, maybe I'm the only one who's ever thought stuff like that. <laughs> it seems like the area that comes under the attack the most often in my life is my voice. And yet he called me to preach. Yep. Wow. And I know Andrew can deal with yep. that as well. So sometimes I find myself choking and coughing and losing yep. my voice yep. and gagging right in front of 50 or 150 people. Yep. And then internally I'm like, why don't you heal me? <laughs> you asked me to stand up here and do this. Exactly. And I'm doing everything in my power to be. Am I the only one who ever thinks silly yeah. things like that? Yeah. That's, you know? right. That's right. <laughs> so. I could work better for you if you'd fix my finances, God. This would be easier if you'd help me with this marriage. <laughs> what do you do when you think you're close to a God who doesn't manifest the way you think he should at the time you think he should? Because sometimes he's casual to the point of just seeming callous. And I found that most of the time it's not that people don't believe in God. It's not that they don't believe in his existence. They just question his character sometimes. Yeah. It's not his reality that's on trial. It's his, it's, it's his character. Right. People are terrified of what might come next in life. Yeah. A, a, another tragic shooting. A terrorist attack. Uh, another natural disaster. Mm -hmm. A plane crash. A train wreck. People yeah. are scared to death of what might come next in life. And forget about the outside forces. Let's just talk about the inside forces in our own life, and our own heart. Many of us are dealing with circumstances every day or every week that could go one way or another. Just the pressures of life, yeah. the stress of failed relationships, failed businesses, 
struggling to raise children and grandchildren in a world where every day they encounter people telling them the opposite of what you told them. Yeah, right. <laughs> our relationship with God is the anchor in our lives. At the end of the day, it's the thing that keeps us rooted and grounded. So in our personal life, and for the sake of everyone you're going to come into contact with every day, you need to have an understanding of His love and a revelation of His character so you can properly reconcile the events of your life. Okay? So it becomes important to be able to reckon that in your life so you can help others find peace and love in their lives when they're going yeah, through yeah. difficult situations. So Jesus takes his time getting there, even though Lazarus needs him. But when he does arrive, and he comes into the room, and he sees how everything has affected all of the people around, <clears throat> he sees how they feel. He was touched by the feelings of their weaknesses. Yeah. The on-scene reporter that day recorded these words about what happened next. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now, he wasn't crying for Lazarus. I mean, let's be straight about it. He wasn't crying for Lazarus because he understood eternity. He knew what it was like to transition from this realm to the next. He wasn't grieving because of Lazarus. He was touched by their pain. He was touched by their pain. It was the loss they felt that he was feeling too. He was identifying with them as one of them. He was their priest. He was their priest. Jesus, the high priest, was touched with the feelings of their weaknesses. He bonded with them. He connected with them. He grieved with them. You know why earlier in the story he wasn't moved that way when he first heard about Lazarus being sick? He wasn't standing in the office of a priest at that time. He was standing in the office of a prophet. So he made the declaration, the purpose of this sickness is not death, but that God will get the glory. Amen. That's a prophecy is what that is. That's him releasing a prophetic word. And even though Lazarus did die, Jesus knew that death was not powerful enough to stop the purpose of God from coming to pass. He knew that. The prophet Jesus knew that. That's why he said, death is not how this is going to end. So prophet Jesus is able to stay calm in chaos because he's already seen the beginning from the end. Yeah. And he understands the full picture when it comes to the purpose of God. So the prophet doesn't get too worked up about it, what's taking place in the middle, because he's already been given a vision for an end result. Right. He's already seen the purpose of God. Jesus, the prophet, knows you're going to make it through. He knows you're going to be all right. He knows God's going to get glory out of what you're going through. He's not distracted by the pain because he's focused on the purpose. That's Jesus, the prophet. Right. Not distracted by the pain. Because he's focused on the purpose. Jesus the priest sits with you in your pain, in your struggle, and he feels what you feel, and it matters to him. And he ministers to you, and he encourages you. He slipped into the role of a priest. He allowed himself to be touched by the feelings of their infirmities, and he asked them, where have you laid the body? Show me. Now, he knew, but for the sake of everyone around, including the critics of his ministry that no doubt had, had arrived on the scene by this point, he asked anyway, and they said, this is where his body is. <clears throat> and now this is where it gets really good. This is where the story gets really good. Somewhere between the house and the graveyard, the Bible says that he groaned in his spirit one more time and he grieved with them. But then he takes off the garments of a priest and he puts on the royal robe of a king by the time he makes his way to the entrance of the tomb. All right. By the way, it says entrance because they never needed access until he came along. <laughs> He started calling people out of them. He stands outside the tomb as the king of kings, and he tells the dead man, come out. Lazarus, come out. Yeah. Now the priest would have gone in there with him. The priest would have went in there because that's what priests do. That's what pastors do. That's what Pastor Jesus does. Bears burdens, cares for them. He helps them cope. He helps them find resolution. But the king stood outside the tomb, and he called Lazarus out of where he was and said, yeah. join me out here where I am. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You cannot stay in your cave when the king is calling. You cannot stay in your cave when the king is calling. There's not a grave cave anywhere that can hold you. There's no addiction strong enough, no addiction, no bondage strong enough to keep you wrapped up or chained down when the king of kings calls your name. That's right. That's right. It doesn't matter how bad your situation stinks because when he says roll the stone out of the way, they said, Lord, he stinks. He's been dead four days. It doesn't matter how bad the situation stinks, how long you've been in there. When he stands over you and he calls your name, you've got to come out of it. Amen. 
you've got to come out of it. Amen? Amen. Well, the reason Jesus seems like so many different people in the story of Lazarus is the same reason he seems to be a different person at different times in your life. And it's not because he's bipolar, by the way. <laughs> he's maturing you to understand his fullness to you, in you, and through you. And you're also beginning to understand who he is, how he is, and where he is. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that understanding yields great peace in your life. There are seasons in your life when he's prophesying to you and he's declaring your destiny. He's decreeing God will get the glory. Then there are times in your life where he's touched by your weaknesses and infirmities and he's your priest, your pastor that you run to and you find grace in time of need. But then the scene shifts and he takes on a new role and as the king of glory, he calls you out of the cave. He calls you out of the cave. From one season to the next, from one level to the next, from one assignment to the next, from one dimension to the next, the king of glory calls, you have to come. You have to come out of whatever you're in. In fact, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. On the other side of death is life. What appears to be the end of a thing there is simply a new beginning. It's simply a new beginning. So David hid out of the cave of Adullam. When he was hiding, he was hiding from King Saul. However, David realized that the castle was his destiny. The cave was only a cocoon. Wow. The cave was only a cocoon. And plus, the cave wasn't even the real hiding place anyway. While David is hiding in the cave of Adol, he writes, he writes several psalms, but we're going to look at one of them, Psalm 57. He wrote this one while hiding in the cave of Adol. It is from the Passion Translation. He says, please God, show me mercy. Open your grace fountain for me, for you are my soul's true shelter. In other words, it's not the cave keeper me safe, it's you, Lord. You are my true shelter. I will hide. Look at how this coincides with Psalm 91. I will hide beneath the shadow of your embrace under the wings of your cherubim until this trouble is past. This is all talking about the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the presence, being under his wings means being enveloped in his presence. I will cry out to you, the God of the highest heaven, the mighty God who performs all these wonders for me. From heaven he will send the Father's help to save me. He will trample down those who trample me. He will always show me love by his gracious and constant care. Another text, Psalm 119, verse 114. Funny enough, I, quote, I started by quoting the shortest verse in the Bible. Now we're taking a verse out of the longest chapter in the Bible. <laughs> Psalm 119, 114. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Now scholars are split right down the middle on whether Ezra the scribe wrote this chapter or whether King David did. Most believe it was David. It really doesn't matter. The author realized that God was the refuge, not a cave. God was the refuge. The Lord is our hiding place. He's our safe place to run to. And we started off the first text we read this morning. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. In Him will I trust. The hiding places that we create that are the unhealthiest are the ones in our own hearts. Yeah. They're the ones we have in our own hearts. And we all have hiding places. We all have them. We all hide. We all have places we hide. The expectation of no attack coming, no difficulty in life, is a setup for disappointment. Yes, sir. <laughs> because life can get rough at times. Life can get rough at times. So the psalmist here sets himself up for success because he designates ahead of time where he's going to hide when the attack comes. He designates ahead of time where his refuge is. The Lord is my hiding place. Now, you can't wait till the attack comes to try to figure out where you're going to go. Yeah, all right. Of course, we, we, I was born and raised in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, thunderstorms pop up fast. And when they do, they also can get severe fast. Now, I love thunderstorms. But then when they, get, when they start breaking stuff everywhere, they're not so much fun after that. <laughs> but when they go severe, every family that lives in Oklahoma, every smart family, has a plan in place ahead of time. They know, the family knows where to go when the sirens go off, where to go. Where will we meet? If we're not all there, then the kids know where to go. 
and hopefully they have a storm shelter. But if not, they know where in the house to go. They know the place ahead of time. Ahead of time. Because sometimes the storm comes with no warning. Sometimes the storm comes in the middle of the night, which is the worst night. You don't hide, don't hide in a place that will confine you and restrict you. A cave is a place that confines. It blocks sunlight and over an extended period of time, it restricts breathing as well. So my question is, what cave are you hiding in? Now I'm wrapping up. I just want to ask you, I ask, I ask you to grab a post and go on your way in. And I hope you did. Grab your pen. Grab your post-it note and put on there. This isn't something everyone's going to look at. You don't have to sign your name to it. This is, this is a symbolic gesture this morning. Because what I want us to do is while I'm praying here in just a few moments this morning, I want us all to bring them to the front and lay them across this step. Lay them across the step. And then in your mind and in your heart, when you turn around, you tell yourself, I'm walking out of this cave. And I'm walking into the wide open spaces that is the presence of God. Now, let me tell you some caves that some people hide in. Some people hide in the cave of low expectation. Yeah. Low expectation. And they do that so they can avoid disappointment. And yeah. what I mean is, if I don't expect much from myself or let others expect much from me, then nobody gets disappointed. Some hide in the cave of low expectation. Some hide in the cave of blame. They can find someone or something else to blame for where they're at in life or why this turned out a certain way that it alleviates them of responsibility or culpability. So they stay in the cave of blame. But you know what I realized? I'm not going to give anyone that much power over my life. Yeah. I know when I hide out in a place and I lay blame on someone else for why I'm where I'm at, the problem with that is that if they're the reason I'm there, then I can't get out until they let me out. So I released blame a long time ago. I don't blame anyone for where I'm at or for my lot in life because I'm not going to empower anyone in my life like that. Some hide in the cave of addiction because it allows them to numb the pain and avoid the necessary internal work that's needed. Let's get real. Some hide in pornography. Some hide in one night stands. You know why people hide in pornography in one night stands? Because it allows them to either find pleasure or fend off loneliness right. and safely avoid the frustrating process of vulnerability, accountability, and responsibility that comes along with intimacy and relationships. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I know I just said a mouthful. Right? We can take that and we can unpack that. We can have psychology classes on it and all of that. But the truth of the matter is some people don't know why they do the things they do. Right. Someone in the cave just agreed for a while. But they found it easier to cope in the cave than to move forward outside of it. Yeah. So they're still stuck in the cave. Yep. Still breathing. <laughs> come out of the cave. The king calls you to come out of the cave. Yeah. Caves are where they buried the dead in Bible times. <laughs> right. Caves are where they buried the dead. Now the Bible says, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Not in a cave somewhere. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But I cannot experience life in dead places. So I have to know where to hide when life gets rough. And I don't hide in insecurities. I don't hide in fears. I don't hide in caves that restrict and confine me. But I run to the Lord when life gets rough. Amen. When it's at its roughest and most fiercest, I run to the Lord. Amen. And I allow His presence to be my refuge, my fortress, yes, when the winds of life are blowing. Amen? Yeah. Why do we use hiding places? Because wrong hiding places shield us from the inconvenience of change. And the truth of the matter is, we love to read books about change. We'll sing songs about them. We'll talk about change. We'll preach sermon series on change, but we don't really like to change. <laughs> when it comes right down to it, we just don't, we like the idea of change. We just don't like the work of it. Now, we talk about healing sometimes and we celebrate it, rightfully so. But oftentimes we fail to realize that healing can be a process. Yes, it is. Especially emotional healing. Yeah. Now, what we want sometimes is, is we want just, all right, Lord, heal me. Somebody anoint me. Let me fall out of the spirit. The right person blow on me or wave a coat over me. Somebody dump oil on my head. I just want to walk away completely healed. And you know the glorious thing is that sometimes we do. But not all the time. Right. Sometimes healing means unpacking trauma, having difficult conversations, taking radical responsibility for your actions, 
implementing healthy routines, setting and enforcing boundaries. You see, those are the five reasons why sometimes it's easier to stay in the cave. Because that is a work of intentionality. It's the equivalent of Jesus telling them when Lazarus, Lazarus responded. I mean, he's, a, he's, he's cold and dead on a slab wrapped in grave clothes. And the king says, Lazarus, come out. You ever hear the old song Carmen did? Lazarus, come forth. That phenomenal song, man. So powerful. I get chills up and down me every time I hear it. And he's, up, he's, he's in glory or he's over with the same stock. And he goes, you know what? I think I hear him calling right now. I gotta go. You know? And he goes back into his body and he comes out. But then Jesus turns to the bystanders and he says, loose him. Yeah, that's right. Loose him now and let it go. Don't you know he stank? Oh, yeah. He had the stench of death on him. Wrapped up in grave clothes. Yeah. So the king called him out of the situation. And sometimes we think that's good enough. That's good enough. Yeah. But no, now, now you have to unpack it. Now you have to talk. Now you have to be bathed and washed in the water of the word. Amen. Now you have to unpack the, the process of healing. And, the, and, and we sometimes right. project these images to people in public. We project these images to people in public. But emotionally, we hide in our cave. Yeah. We hide in our cave. <clears throat> the reason we project an image is to hide an insecurity. The reason we project an image is to hide an insecurity. An area of our life we're insecure about, so we project an image. The thing about hiding in the Lord, it's like hiding in wide open spaces. <laughs> That's the thing about hiding in the Lord. If He's our refuge, if He's our fortress, if He's our shelter, if He is our... He is who we run to. He is our refuge. The thing about hiding in Him, though, is like hiding in plain sight in wide open spaces. The reason why that's intimidating is because sometimes it requires vulnerability. Sometimes we have to pray and release some situations and release some struggles. Stand up with me. I hope you have your sticky note ready. Give us the courage that this 
symbolic act is much bigger than this. This is just a symbolic act, but connected to it is a very intentional heart right now. A very intentional heart. I'm intending in my heart to lay this down and to walk out of that cave and to trust in you. To trust in you. I want to invite you now just to bring it, bring it up. No set order. Just bring it up. Throw it on the altar. As you, the only thing I want to ask you is as you return to your seat, when you turn around and walk off, in your heart say, I'm walking out of this cave. I'm leaving this behind me. Go ahead and come on. Go ahead and come on. I'm leaving this behind me.
your life. So just let us know how we can stand with you, okay? Amen. All right, we love you guys. Brother Gary.